Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to be talking about chemistry, and I know right now you're asking yourself why are we talking about chemistry if biology is the course, and if you do a little bit of reading here on the page, you'll see that chemistry actually helps explain a lot of the basic ways in which life works, especially at the cellular level. How, does, how do cells take in food and actually turn it into an energy system for them to use, or understanding how cells reproduce, or how they change. So we have to have at least a little bit of a foundation in the chemical world to understand fully what's going on in the biological world. So the learning objectives for today, you're going to learn about the relationship between the atom and the element, uh, understand how to read the periodic table of elements, identify, be able to identify protons from neutrons from electrons, identify the two key parts of the atom, um, called the atomic nucleus and the electron shells, and know how to draw basic Lewis dot structure and valence shell models of atoms. So let's talk about elements. An element is defined as a substance made up of one and only one type of atom. We'll get to the definition of an atom later. But basically, that means that all atoms in an element, like hydrogen or oxygen or sodium, which you see over here, hydrogen, oxygen, and sodium, they all behave, chemically speaking, in about the same way as other atoms. So hydrogen always behaves the same way, whether it's a hydrogen atom uh, on one side of the planet versus a hydrogen atom on the other side of the planet. Now, um, a key point of this is to understand that um, we define atoms partially by the number of protons. So hydrogen always has one proton. And if we change the number of protons, so if we take hydrogen and you added another proton, having two protons, it would no longer be hydrogen. It would then be helium. So changing the number of protons in the nucleus changes the element you're dealing with, but only when you are changing the number of protons. That does not happen with the number of uh, neutrons or electrons. So if I take a hydrogen and add another electron, so there's one here, and you add another electron here, that's still a hydrogen atom. If I added a neutron, which we'll talk about, those go into the nucleus, but if I added a neutron, that's still a hydrogen atom. So you can change the number of neutrons and electrons, and it's still the same element. But if, when you start changing the number of protons, you're going between elements, usually by either increasing or decreasing the number of protons. So oxygen will always have eight protons. Sodium will always have 11 protons. Sometimes the number of electrons or neutrons especially can vary from, el from um, different types. If you have isotopes, if you know anything about chemistry, you know what an isotope is. But that's not something we truly have to worry about. So for now, just know that protons are how we definitively say this is a hydrogen atom or this is an oxygen atom or this is a sodium atom. So here's a picture of the periodic table of elements. The elements have been arranged by chemists in a very specific structure, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but just know that most of the names come from a Latin root for each of the names. So for instance, iron was originally called ferrous in Latin. I think because of the reddish color iron gets when it oxidizes with um, oxygen. Um, so the symbol for iron is Fe, which is right here on the periodic table. So just be aware, sometimes it does help to have a bit of a, uh, an understanding of Latin for some of the earlier and older elements that we know of. So the periodic table of elements works as a way of predicting chemical patterns. Its best known creator, a gentleman by the name of Mendeleev, actually predicted the properties of three elements years before they were actually discovered in the laboratory. And here's how he did it, basically. Um, here we have a very organized system for laying out playing cards. And you'll see that just by looking at the patterns, both vertically and horizontally, we can tell what's missing. So going from the top left here, we have two, three, four, blank, six. So this better be a five. And you can see that these are all of the suit of spades. And that down here below it, there are also five. So that helps our prediction that supports the idea that five is the number behind that. And you see the suit of hearts, clubs, diamonds, and then what's the one missing? Spades. Draw a little spade here. And using the patterns that you see both horizontally along the rows and then vertically along the columns, you should be able to predict what other cards are missing. So 
we'll do one more together and I'll let you guys try the other two over here you should have eight nine ten and this will be the nine of hopefully diamonds so go ahead and make a quick prediction and we'll see if you're right so Metal Leaf studied the properties in the rows and the columns of his version of the periodic table, and when he did this, he found that he had gaps where he thought something should go, that there should be some element. And because he knew what surrounded these elements, both, so if we do here the seven of diamonds, he knew what was around it both horizontally and vertically. He said, well, it's got to fit between this and this and between this and this. And so that's how he actually discovered the elements of galanium, scandium, and germanium before they were actually really discovered and um, described in a, in a laboratory. So now let's try that same idea of um, looking at the patterns in the table to figuring out the gaps on the periodic table. So I've taken an, uh, the periodic table here and I've blocked out four different elements. Let's see if we can find some basic properties or make predictions on their basic properties, I should say. So the first one in the top right here, you can see, that's, that's this one up here. You can see the numbers on the left side go at 5, blank, 7, 8, 9. This is the atomic number, so the atomic number here is hopefully about 6. And then you can see there's another number down below. That is the mass of the element, the mass number. You can see on the left side it goes from about 10 or 11 to 14. Let's just do a nice easy split, let's say 6 and 12, those two numbers. Let's do one more together on the fourth row here, on the next to potassium. The number here is 19 and then 21, so hopefully this number is 20. And then you have 39 to about 45, so that's about a six point difference. Let's go three up, so let's try a mass of 42. So go ahead and try the last three on your own and then let's see how close you can be. So you're doing this two and this one. So was I close? I was okay on the carbon. Uh, I was a little bit off on the calcium, but you're still close enough within reason. But that's basically how Mendeleev worked this process. So let's talk about the actual definition of the term atom now. An atom is defined as the smallest particle of an element that still behaves like that element. So for example, an iron atom can still conduct electricity, heat, and be attracted to magnets no matter where that iron atom is. Um, and atoms, I hope you know by now, are made up of a combination of three smaller particles. And when we say smaller than the size of an atom, the term we use is subatomic. So when you see subatomic, just think smaller than atom. First one is called a proton. That is a positively charged particle uh, found in the nucleus of the atom. So sometimes you'll see it as a little symbol with a plus or a P. The opposite of the proton is called an electron. Electrons are negatively charged subatomic particles found in the space around the nucleus. So protons are found in the nucleus, electrons are found around the nucleus. The symbols for electrons, well there's three possibilities. You can sometimes see a negative symbol in the circle or an E, or the more common one you'll see a lot of times in your textbook would be probably this, the E with a little minus on that. And lastly we have the neutrons. These are neutral subatomic particles, so they have no charge. They are neutral, and they are too, like the proton, found in the nucleus, so in the nucleus. Um, the symbols for that can be the circle with the N, or little equal signs, or it can be just left blank because there's no charge. So that's the basic subatomic particles, and understanding those three and what their charges are and where they're found is a good portion of what you need to understand chemistry, but the other big portion is this simple little rule. If you have opposite charges, they're going to be attracted to each other. If you have like charges, similar charges, they are going to repel each other. So positive and negative will always attract each other, two negatives would repel each other, and so would two positive charges. They would repel each other as well. So what do atoms actually look like? Well, there's been lots of attempts to try and visualize a model for an atom going back many, many, many hundreds of years. Um, this first version I'm showing you is called Dalton's atom. He basically thought it was a solid sphere. Now, after some experimentation and discovering that there were parts of it that were positively charged and parts of it that were 
natively charged, we get Thompson's plum pudding model, which um, plum pudding is a uh, dish in England. So for us, let's call it the chocolate, chocolate chip. I probably spelled chocolate wrong. Chocolate chip model. Basically, the protons are the dough, the chocolate chips are the electrons. Rutherford's atom um, design came about when they discovered that, well, all the positive charges seem to be located only in the center of the atom. And so the electrons were spaced around it. And again, the thing all three of these first models all have in common, these are all solid models. That is, they thought the atom was just a solid object. When you get down here to Bohr's planetary atom, after some more experimentation, we had discovered that the atom is mostly just empty space. So this is a space model. Let's put empty to be clear. So an empty space model. Again, protons are still in the nucleus. Notice there's more protons now. And the electrons are traveling in a defined path around the nucleus. So they have set patterns in how they travel. And then a much more current version of the electron of the um, atomic structure is over here on the bottom right. Now we have protons and the paths of the atoms have become more complex the paths of the electrons have become more complex. They go in these little arrangements they call electron clouds. Um, and now we have neutrons too. Neutrons were discovered when they figured out atoms were too heavy for what they thought, and they said, well, what's this extra mass coming from? But it, it's something's there, but it has no charge, and they said, well, there's no charge, we'll just call it neutron for neutral. So the model that you're expected to know for biology has two main parts. The nucleus, the central area of the atom, where you find the protons and the neutrons, and the electron shells, that's the area, the empty space mostly, around the nucleus where the electrons are found. The outermost electron shell, the furthest one from the nucleus, is called the valence shell. That's the outermost shell with an actual electron in it. So here is another little quick picture of a, um, an atom, and again, you have the nucleus with the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, the electrons are on the outside, so the valence shell would be this shell out here on the outer edge. This inner edge, inner orbital here, is not the valence shell, so this is the valence shell on the outside. It's always the last one. So electrons, they are small. They are much smaller in scale compared to protons, and even this picture shows. Um, and they move very, 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 very fast. So fast that it's actually impossible to, pre um, to actually see an electron. You can only predict where they're going to be. So this little picture here is actually probably the best, most accurate version of a picture of an atom you're ever going to see. The atomic nucleus is very, very tiny in the center, and then you see two rings. One ring here, and one bigger ring out here. These are the two valence, I'm sorry, the two electron shells. The valence shell is again on the outside, so that's the valence shell there. And you see all these dots, and all these dots are is probabilities. That's the probability of finding an electron in that space. And you can see the electrons tend to travel in that nice shell around that, but there's sometimes they can go out way out here occasionally, but most of the times they're in that little shell area. So how to draw electron shells? You will need to know parts of this. So the shell is always drawn from the inside out. So you have the nucleus in the center with how many of the protons and neutrons you have and the electrons surrounding it. The first shell is the closest shell. So here with one, two electrons in it is the first shell. Then you go to the second shell here with one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in it, and you'll notice these empty space. Those are empty because the second shell can actually hold a maximum of eight electrons. Because it's further away, it has more space. And for this atom in particular, um, there simply doesn't have enough electrons. So this is an empty 
orbital usually is how we would say this. So this guy does in truth have two, six, has eight electrons, two in the first shell and six in the valence shell, the second shell. Here's hydrogen. Again, hydrogen's a very simple atom. One proton, one electron. Its electron is in the first shell. The first shell would be what we would call the valence shell. So yeah, that's the empty place in the second. So let's move on to talking about the specific cards that you would see on the periodic table. Um, this is for the element helium. The atomic number here in this case is two. So that's from here. This is the atomic number. The atomic mass in this case is four. And that's coming from here. Sometimes you'll hear this called atomic mass and sometimes you'll hear it called mass number. It's the same exact thing. So just by those two numbers you should be able to figure out all of the amounts of the subatomic particles. So the atomic number is the number of protons. Remember I said atoms are defined by the number of protons. So the number of protons is just two. Now the trick is understanding that most atoms are neutral overall, meaning they have just as many positive charges as they do negative charges. So if you have two positive charges, you must have two negatives. So two positive must cancel out with two negative charges. The number of neutrons gets a little bit more complex. And that's uh, because this number here, the mass number, is the number of protons plus neutrons because that's the mass of the whole nucleus. And here's where you have to do a little bit of common sense thinking. Well, if this number four is the mass of the whole nucleus together, again, the electrons have very little mass. They account for almost nothing in terms of the mass itself. If, so if four is the amount of the neutrons and the protons together, essentially ignoring the electrons, to get the neutrons, the number of neutrons by themselves, well, you have to take the mass number so the M, N, and subtract the number of protons. Or, another way of saying that, instead of just subtracting the number of protons, you could just subtract the atomic number, because that's the same thing. And that will give you the number of neutrons. So here it's four minus two, which is just two neutrons. Let's put an N there. So two neutrons, two electrons, two protons. So the good news is in biology is that you only have to worry about understanding four to eight key elements and their chemistry. Uh, these are the overall eight elements you need to worry about for most of life. The big four, however, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, appear in almost all forms of life, so you have to know those. So again, the cards on the periodic table, here we have fluorine with its mass number and its atomic number, you should be able to look at that at any point and tell me how many protons, how many neutrons, how many electrons. So the atomic number, once again, is the number of protons. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, the mass in the nucleus. And so you have to subtract the mass number minus the atomic number to get the number of neutrons by themselves. And because we assume the fluorine is neutral overall, the number of protons, the number of positives must equal the number of negatives. So if you have nine positive, you better have nine negative as well. So nine protons, positive, nine electrons, negative. And in this case, if you do 19, I rounded it, 19 minus nine, that gives you 10 neutrons. So I'd like for you guys to try this one on your own. You can pause the video at this point and come back when you are done with your um, estimates of how many protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, hopefully you got this answer of three protons, four neutrons, and three electrons. This is actually what a, uh, a basic model of lith a lithium atom looks like. Again, three protons, three neutrons, and then three electrons. Again, we know the electrons are in this configuration because you have two in the first shell, 
and then one more in the third shell because remember the first shell can only hold two and then the third one must go into the second shell here. So you always start working from the inside and work out. So in this case, the valence shell would be the second shell. So that would be your valence shell. So now that we've practiced with fluorine and helium, let's talk about different versions of these um, atoms in terms of models. So this is a Bohr's model of fluorine. Again, it shows everything. Nine protons, 10 neutrons, nine electrons. And in the outermost shell, the second shell here, we have seven valence electrons. So one, two, one, two three, four, five, six, seven, even though we have nine electrons overall. So we care more about the valence shell of an atom in, in um, biology than anything else because that's where all the chemistry happens. The inner shell, it really doesn't do anything. It's stable. It's not reactive. The outer shell, the valence shell, that's where all the exciting stuff happens. So we actually have a model that's specific just to the valence shell. It's called the valence shell model. So instead of having to draw all the circles for these nucleus, you just write 9p, 10n, 9 protons, 10 neutrons. And then notice they don't even show the inner shell. They just show the valence shell. The inner shell is useless to them because it doesn't do anything chemically. And another version of this, a much more even simplified version, is called the Lewis dot structure. And here you have the symbol for fluorine F in the center, and then these dots around it. And they are arranged in a specific pattern we'll go over. But the dots, these guys, are the electrons. So the order they put these dots in works like this. And I would make sure you get this down in your notes somewhere. So first one, second, third, fourth, and then fifth, six, seven, eight. So it looks kind of like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here's helium. Once again, this is a Bohr model. And you can see it has two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. The electrons only are in the first shell only because that's how many electrons helium has. So the valence shell model, it just says 2p, 2n, and then you see the full valence electron, or the full valence shell, excuse me. And the Lewis dot structure would be the symbol for helium, he, and then one dot at one, and then the second dot at two. That's how you do a basic Lewis dot structure. So, Thanks for watching, guys. Next time, we're going to be talking about the different types of chemical bonds. Make sure you ask for help in class should you need help understanding any of the topics we talked about today.